Now we're going to mix the chemotherapy and the gel foam. The first thing that I'll show you is the gel foam slurry, which is uh, gel foam pledget, which is cut into little pieces and then essentially macerated through a stopcock to create a solution of smaller particles mixed with contrast. We use that to slow down the flow in the vessel that we treat after the treatment is completed. This helps increase the dwell time or the length of exposure of the tumor to the chemotherapy. We don't want to block that vessel completely, we just want to slow the flow. The ethinol is being drawn up now, and again, that's based on poppy seed oil or derived from poppy seed oil. It has a consistency similar to olive oil. To allow good mixing with that oil-based contrast, the chemotherapy agents are mixed in a solution with similar viscosity, which involves contrast material and sterile water or normal saline. This is the cisplatin, which is 50 milligrams of cisplatin in this small volume. It's important to have it in a small volume because when we administer the drug, we don't want to overwhelm the arterial circulation in which it's being placed because that would increase the systemic exposure. So it's crucial to have these drugs mixed specifically for this procedure in a very small volume. The doxorubicin will be next, which is red. That again is 50 milligrams. For hepatocellular carcinoma, I typically use 50 milligrams of each of these drugs. One could use 100 milligrams of either drug or a 50 milligram dose of either drug, uh, but I think it's beneficial to combine them both. These agents will then be mixed via a stopcock to get them thoroughly and evenly distributed in the solution. You have to do this uh, fairly expeditiously because the ethiodol will degrade plastic stopcocks and start to leak, and then you would lose some of the drugs. So we load it into smaller syringes for administration through the microcatheter, which is what we're looking at here. The microcatheter is a three French catheter, which uh, we don't always need to use, but when we're out in a small branch, it is better tolerated than the five French catheter and allows us to go around more turns and bends. The material is going to be injected under continuous fluoroscopic observation so that we can see exactly where it's going. It's crit critical to make sure that there is not backflow into an undesired vessel, uh, which would, in this case, potentially expose the gastroduodenal artery feeding the pancreas and the duodenum to the chemotherapy. We want the chemotherapy to go to the liver in the area we're trying to treat, not to any other organs. Uh, in a little while, we'll flip forward to the uh, angiographic images showing that material going in. After the material is in and the small amount of gel foam is administered, then that catheter is removed and uh, the sheath is removed. We use a variety of closure devices which uh, sometimes allow the patient to be up and walking within about 30 minutes. This is footage uh, from the procedure just showing in a minute here the contrast going in, but I want you to pay attention to a still shot that's coming up very shortly here that will show a lot of black or gray density at the top of the liver. That is after we're done treating. And if you kind of keep that picture in your head, as we go forward, the next shot of the liver will show the smaller amount of material here that was present before we treated today. The stuff that's being put in now is the chemoemulsion mixture, and that is coming into that vessel and will gradually build up in the area of tumor to end with that darker gray appearance that you saw in that still shot just a few moments ago. So that is basically the gist of the procedure. And uh, at this point, we would take the catheter out after we finish and the patient would go to a recovery area. The procedures are usually staggered with treatments every three to four weeks uh, to alternating sides of the liver and the patients are monitored overnight. Thank you very much, Dr. Grant. That's a fascinating uh, presentation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the patient uh, feels after the procedure and over the next uh, few days and few weeks uh, uh, after the treatment? Sure. Um, during the procedure, there can be some abdominal pain, especially when the chemotherapy is being administered. It's usually a deep, achy kind of pain and can vary from minimal to a pain requiring narcotics. And we have those available during the procedure uh, to keep that pain well controlled. If it occurs, it usually lasts between two and six hours. Usually by that evening or the following morning, the pain will be pretty much resolved or well controlled with oral medications. Not everybody gets that pain, and with hepatocellular carcinoma, I have 
anecdotally noted that those are the patients who tend to have very little pain, actually. Um, I don't know if it's related to cirrhotic changes within the liver and, and decreased innervation, but for whatever reason, they seem to breeze through it, relatively speaking. Pretty much everybody does get two weeks of feeling a little bit tired and punky after the procedure, though, regardless of whether they have pain or not. Okay. Any other major complications that you worry about? Uh, complications that you can have would include complete occlusion of the vessel with it not reopening, which is very well tolerated usually, but does limit your ability to go back. Uh, you can get biliary strictures, and in patients who've had previous bile duct surgery, such as a Whipple procedure or even a sphincterotomy, they are at higher risk for abscess. Okay. What, how many of the chemoembolization procedures can you uh, carry out in a, in a single patient? What's the usual uh, number and uh, can you give us a little information about that? Sure. Um, there's the simple answer is that there's no set limit. Uh, because the toxicity to the rest of the body is limited in terms of the doxorubicin dose, we're really not subject to the limitations that the systemic or IV chemotherapy has. So we can continue to treat as long as it's working and as long as you can still get the catheter where you need it to get. So there's no set limit on the number of treatments. Okay. As long as the patient's tolerating things and anatomically you can, you can get there. Yes. Uh, and the patient's benefiting from the treatment. There are, there are cases where we are able to halt treatment and watch and only treat again if there's progression of disease. Uh, this particular patient has had a three-month hiatus between this treatment and his previous set, and we hope to have at least another three-month hiatus now. So there are often points where you can pause and let them go back to their life and not be... Yeah. spending time in the hospital. And his, his quality of life in, in these uh, treatment breaks is reasonably uh, good? After the first two weeks, I, I think he would say it's pretty good. Um, some treatments are harder than others, and sometimes the recovery is a little bit longer than two weeks. So, uh, And there is some effect of decreased tolerance when you get into the higher number yes. of treatments. So we do try to space them out as much as we can without giving up the advantage we've gained. Okay. All right.